Hello, everyone. I would like to start with a statement. The violent attacks we have witnessed at the capitals in Salem, Washington, D.C., and around the country, as well as the lackluster responses they have been met with by the authorities, are antithetical to our democracy, pursuit of freedom, and American values that our ancestors fought and died for. When the Confederate flag is waved high and our votes are baselessly declared fraudulent, we have no disillusions about what we are up against. It is clear that these attacks committed by angry mobs and condoned by the country's highest office are rooted in racist white supremacist ideologies. These disturbing events have bolstered our resolve in the pressing urgency of Dr. King's nonviolent tactics, his calls for unity and his unwavering commitment to positive change for all people. We are convinced more than ever that the time is now that we truly cannot wait any longer. Welcome everybody to the live Q&A on why we cannot wait. And thank you so much for joining us. My name is Van Speech. I'm the director and lead organizer of this year's MLK celebration. I hope you all enjoyed that video premiere. So much work and organizing was put into it, but it was such a wonderful journey going through that process of reading this book with all of these community members. And I'm so thankful for the entire MLK committee. I hope that what we are exemplifying catches on to our community and beyond. We're here today to take a deeper dive, to continue to discuss Dr. King's message and the parallels of this book, as well as pull insight from two 1960s civil rights activists. We encourage all of our viewers to get this book, read this book, but also participate in this conversation as we'll be monitoring the comments on the at SOMLK Day Facebook page. So please be sure to ask questions there in our question section of the program, which will be shared by our hosts later. Without further ado, I would like to welcome all of our panelists and I'm so glad to be introducing our co-hosts for this afternoon. Two individuals from different generations that brought so much out in our book discussion over the last couple months. Dominique Toyer and my man, Mike Green. Dominique is the proud mother of a three-year-old in Medford and is the research director for Southern Oregon Coalition for Racial Equity, my girl. Mike Green is a cultural economist living in Southern Oregon and serves as the chief economic strategist for the National Institute for Inclusive Competitiveness, my man. With that, I will turn it over to Dominique the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Vance. Words cannot describe how excited I am. I have butterflies to be uh, here virtually with some civil rights leaders and elite set of panelists. And uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. John L. Dolan. In the summer of 1961, groups of black and white students traveled together uh, through the South protesting the segregation of interstate buses and bus terminals in what would become known as the Freedom Rides. One of those young Freedom Riders was Dr. John Luther Dolan. At the time, Dr. Dolan was a junior at UC Berkeley and a member of the Local Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, which organized the trip to Jackson, Mississippi as part of a national effort after being arrested in June of 1961 in Mississippi, Dr. Dolan traveled further onto New Orleans. And there he was severely beaten along with other peaceful protesters and spent six weeks in the state penitentiary. He continued protesting for civil rights upon his release and was then held in New Orleans detention center. None of this stopped Dr. Dolan from continuing with the continuing the fight for what he believed in. When Dr. Dolan eventually returned to Berkeley, he completed his degree and then entered into medical school. Today, he is a retired emergency room physician. Oh my goodness, it is such a pleasure to meet you, Dr. Dolan. And without further ado, I will turn it over to my amazing co-host, Mike Green. Thank you so much, Dominique. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Geneva Craig. She was a child of segregated Selma, Alabama. It was no accident that young Dr. Geneva Craig found herself at church mass meetings 
when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came to speak there. A self-described angry teen, Dr. Craig was frustrated by a world in which she couldn't see a life any different than her parents. Under Dr. King's direction and guidance, Dr. Craig committed to and nearly sacrificed her own life fighting for change for herself and others. She was repeatedly jailed for demonstrating for Blacks' right to vote in Alabama. And in March 1965, Dr. Craig was among the hundreds of nonviolent protesters marching from Selma to Montgomery when they, uh, were, um, when they endured a brutal attack by police, referred to today as Bloody Sunday. Her spirit unbroken, Dr. Craig went on to become a registered nurse, earn her PhD, and continue fighting for civil rights. She currently works here at Asante Road Regional Medical Center. So welcome to both of our very special guests and panelists. And for our viewing audience, here's a rundown, a brief rundown of our discussion and how you can participate. Uh, we'll start with an introduction and remarks from our special guests. Then we'll engage our panelists and move right into audience questions. You're welcome to use the comments section on our Facebook page at Southern Oregon MLK Day to post your questions and comments. Carrie will monitor the Facebook thread and send your questions to me and Dominique to share with the panelists and our guests. Finally, we'll wrap with some guidance from our special guests. And without further ado, let's uh, start our live discussion with a couple of civil rights activists who risked their lives participating in direct action nonviolent protests that define the Negro Revolution, which Dr. King wrote about in his first chapter of Why We Can't Wait. Doctors Geneva Craig and John Dolan both have careers in healthcare today, but it was their health at risk when Dr. G crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge with John Lewis and Dr. D was arrested and jailed in Jackson, Mississippi for his part in the Freedom Rides organized by CORE, the Congress on Racial Equality. He even spent time in Mississippi's infamous Parchman Prison. To gain firsthand insight into the organized efforts that drew attention to the issues of the 20th century segregationist policies and practices that we all inherited and still sustain today, let's first hear from Dr. G and then Dr. D on their experiences and the state of voting rights and segregation in schools and communities today. Dr. G, we'll start with you. You were there on Bloody Sunday in 1965, and here we are today, still arguing over voting rights. What would Dr. King say today if he were here? What do you think he would want us to know? Dr. G? You have to, there you go. Okay. All right, I thought someone else was taking over that job of muting and unmuting. But anyhow, what Dr. King would say today is, Geneva, job well done so far. Because when I came along, my early years, there were uh, poll taxes that the voters had to pay along with a literary set test that they had to pass, along with having someone vouch for them who was already a registered voter that predominantly met a white person. And those were some of just a few of the tactics that were put in place for my parents and grandparents to not be able to register to vote. And then when I, came along as an angry teenager. And yes, I was angry, very, very disliking white people because everywhere I looked during that time of segregation, sign said white, sign said color. You look at what was under the white sign, privileged. You looked at what was under the colored sign, ghetto. All right, when I say that, water cooler, white, copper tone, pearl handle, water that spout out and arched like the rainbow, nice white pointed cups to drink out of. The box would hum, meaning that refrigeration was occurring to make it cool and refreshing. And when I looked at color, 
I saw a rusted sink, squeaky knobs, speak, 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 when you turn it, and gushing water. <laughs> At no point it cups. You used your hand and you slurp. Big difference. That's just one example of many. Angry, yes. Getting the right to vote, listening to Dr. King, I believed, I believed that it would give us a voice and pave the way for equality where I could drink out of that fountain, where I could go to a good school and get a decent education that would be respected. The right to vote. Today, we have learned many lessons. It's easier now to register because you don't have the literacy test. You don't have the poll taxes that you have to pay. And you don't have to have another person vouch for you to be able to vote today. But apathy had rang among our people of color. Apathy. We made it easier. And in order to get things to change around, we had to have people, just an example of this last election, Stacey Abrams, pounding the pavement, knocking on doors, popping in at churches in different civic groups where the black congregated. Yes. So then and now, same type situation, but circumstances look a little bit different. We have got to continue to encourage one another to become conscientious registered voters and vote. Now I pass it on because I could go on forever. Did uh, I answer your question? Thank you so much, Dr. G. Dr. D, <clears throat> how would Dr. King, in your opinion, uh, perceive today's societal dynamics? What would he say to us? Well, in his book, Why We Can't Wait, I think he outlines very clearly uh, his approach. Now, the book is almost entirely about what happened in Birmingham in 1963, um, which is probably the most solidly segregated city in the South at that time. Uh, but he, he clearly defined the goals that he wanted to improve uh, housing, uh, voting rights, employment, and so on, and then just keep working at it. Now, one of the problems is that a lot has happened in the last six decades. Actually, in his book, he points out that uh, automation was taking jobs away from workers, and then the white workers as well as black workers. And that has only gotten worse in the last 60 years. Mm -hmm. And the result is, you know, the Rust Belt, which used to be solidly democratic, isn't so solidly democratic anymore. And what a lot of people don't realize is, is that the jobs or, or, or the devastation done by automation and uh, in white working class communities has actually devastated the black communities too. And so that brings up a whole different set of problems. Um, now we did have a black president for eight years. And in the last four years, we've gone through a massive reaction against that. Now, hopefully we've ridden through that and uh, in, in the future, we will start making progress again. So I guess I, we, if Dr. Uh, King were here today, he would, first of all, you have to define uh, the problem and what you want to do about it. And then you have to be aggressive. You have to be uh, determined. You have to be persistent. And you have to, uh, well, keep the faith, more or less. And uh, so I'm not being that specific on exactly what we should do because it's rather complicated. And maybe not everyone agrees with me. But we need to. Uh, get our heads together and work hard on the problem and, and don't give up. Uh, I'm from the 60s. The med medical school was near the Haight-Ashbury in the 60s. That's when I was there. I was very much influenced by the hippies. And they had two statements, which I think are relevant today. One is keep on trucking. And the other one is keep the faith, baby. <laughs> okay. Well, let, let, me, let me toss this out to everybody uh, on the panel, including our guests. Uh, Dr. King identified the first of three specific demands of the Negro Revolution that he led when he wrote on page 10 of his book in the first chapter titled The Negro Revolution, 
Why 1963? Dr. King wrote this. He said, there was another factor in the slow pace of progress, a factor of which few are aware and even fewer understand. It is an unadvertised fact that soon after the 1954 decision, the Supreme Court retreated from its own position by giving approval to the pupil placement law. This law permitted the states themselves to determine where school children might be placed by virtue of family background, special ability, and other subjective criteria. The pupil placement law was almost as far reaching in modifying and limiting the integration of schools as the original decision had been in attempting to eliminate segregation. Without technically reversing itself, the court had granted legal sanction to tokenism and thereby gr guarantee that segregation in substance would last for an indefinite period, though formally it was illegal. So I'll toss this question out to all of the panelists and our guests. King speaks directly to the question of ending segregation in schools, housing, and banking as the three demands of the Negro Revolution. He was fighting against systemic segregationist policies and did not trust the states to handle these issues independently. So what is the state of racial segregation and discrimination today in schools, housing, and banking practices? It's it's all the same still. It's still with us. It's still here. Um, and it's and it's apparent in um, the economic wealth gap uh, amongst whites and blacks, right? Because where blacks are having to live, right, determines the schools that they'll go to. So again, when we talk about King's message, um, and we and we and if he were here today, um, I think he would be somewhat proud that his message is in the air, but it's just not being received properly. The details aren't there. We're not reading it properly. We're not getting into uh, some of his tactics in which he was very strategic and methodical in his approach, uh, aligning himself with those three uh, issues that he saw as the big issues that were the overarching uh, default in why, you know, we couldn't overcome in certain areas in this country. And that was a, a limitation in, in education, a limitation in housing and a limitation in, in our economics. Um, and so I say this all the time to, to uh, my wife. <laughs> I, I see uh, segregation as the highest time in this country uh, as, as <coughs> noon on Sunday. <laughs> I see still the white church over here, the black church over here. And I see, to me, that looks more segregated than ever before. So, um, I, I, you know, and, and that was part of the video is, you know, a lot of times we, we look at the 60s as something that was a long time ago and we're not connecting it to, to right now. And it, it is so connected to right now. It is still here. There is so much of that still in place. And I hope that we brought that out. May I make a, a, a comment on that? Um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to give a little historical background. I mean, the United States has always been totally segregated. I mean, slavery was by definition segregated, but even after the abolition of slavery, you had the institution of the Jim Crow system. And Jim Crow system is defined, I, I recommend people uh, read W.B. Du Bois's uh, Souls of Black Folks. I mean, you had a dominant white community and you had <clears throat> the color line and then beneath that you had blacks and there's supposed to be no crossing of that color line and during that time blacks developed their own communities uh, with their own music their own cuisine their own language their own religion and all that was in opposition to the dominant white society uh, and it actually wasn't until maybe 60 70 years ago that any real success uh, against the Jim Crow system uh, started to take effect. And, you know, I always define the classic era of civil rights but between 1955 when Rosa Parks decided not to go to the back of the bus and 1965 when Geneva and her friends decided to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. During that time, they were having uh, attacking kind of low-lying fruit, uh, you know, the, the obvious signs of, of, of segregation. When I was with 
Berkeley Core from 60 to 63, we emphasized mainly housing and we picketed some realty companies and we worried about employment. And I remember picketing Hicks, Hinks Department Store, which was uh, the, the, the largest department store in Berkeley at the time. And by the way, Berkeley at that time was still conservative. Hard to believe that it is or was. And we were successful with Hanks, and it was hard to be successful with housing because you have these institutions like churches. Uh, uh, in 1962, after I came back from the Freedom Ride, that was my senior year of college, we decided to go to the Liberty Hill Baptist Church. Uh, my girlfriend uh, <coughs> and her sister, they were Japanese, and my roommate, who was white. And we were the only non blacks there. And it clearly was a community because they had a, a hymnal there, but no one was paying any attention to it. They all had the songs memorized. They all knew it. They all knew each other. Now, they were very uh, uh, <clears throat> gracious to us and they're very nice people, but clearly we were just visitors. And, and the Liberty Hill Baptist Church is still there. It's on University Avenue around 7th in Berkeley, if you know Berkeley. Uh, it was sort of the epitome of, uh, of a community organization that's hard to break down. Um, and that still goes today. All I'm saying is we are, have, we have made some progress and uh, we need to keep pushing it. And as I said before, you need to define your goal and organize yourself and then just keep pushing at it. That's what Dr. King wants. I just have a few thoughts if, if I can share for a few minutes. So um, for those who don't know me, I am a, a MD. And so I actually came out of public schools in Dayton, Ohio. And so I just want to point out the dynamics that are both seen and unseen when it comes to segregation as far as how it looks in the United States today. So first thing to understand is that public school education in predominantly the black communities is not meeting the standards of education that are able to be achieved in predominantly white communities, regardless of whether they are public, private, religious, or otherwise. The students uh, who are coming through public schools, you know, assuming that they are able to make it through public schools, we actually can tell you there were about 400 or so freshmen in my high school class that I gra or, you know, ended up graduating from, only 99 of us graduated out of 400. What happened to the rest of those children? Where are they today? I have no idea. And so Dr. King points out later on in the book, right around chapter seven or eight, some of the difficulties with nihilism that are taken over the black community. And so some of those things include number one, a lot of these communities where students are expected to perform, they're food deserts. There's no grocery store that actually offers healthy food for these children to get anything healthy to eat. There are a plethora of liquor stores. There are a plethora of fast food stores and whatnot, but there is no adequate nutrition for these babies. On top of that, their parents, if they have the privilege of being able to work, are working insane amount of hours and cannot be there to support their children academically. So there's all these messages just in that right there, not to mention the, what the media feeds to our youth about uh, just the criminality of, of Black people, the deviance of Black people, and how our worth can only be measured if we grow up to become entertainers or athletes. It's, it's all there. And so then let's just say somebody like me makes it through public schools and into college, okay? Then once I get into college, then I'm constantly bombarded with additional methods that compound this worthlessness that I had to try to work my way out through that say, you know what, Sabra, you don't belong here. There's hate speech that's tolerated. Hate speech that is tolerated and has been for years. There are both direct and indirect messages to us as students that we as black students that we have no place there. I remember being a freshman or a sophomore in one of my larger classes in university and I think it was physics and I had to raise my hand and ask a question in the Snickers that were present just because I was like one of like three black people in the whole class and I raised my hand. People knew I had a silly question and when I didn't, you know, everything stops. But throughout my career and throughout my education, what I felt is that Everything externally is built to 
make me and make us feel as if we don't belong. And even when we perform, we're still challenged. There's a wonderful article in the New York Times that even outlines how difficult it is for Black female physicians to stay in practice because of the messages they're getting from their colleagues. They're not competent and they don't belong there. So we have to look at this in a really broad range. It's more than just segregation. It's the messages that we're receiving both internally and externally that we're worthless and that we're deviant and that there is no way for us to progress according to what our society tells us progress is. So what I'm hearing you say, Dr. Saber, is that we've inherited not only segregation as policies and practices, but we've inherited the, inherited the infrastructure of segregation, but along with that, the dynamics of white supremacy the ideology of racial hierarchy, that if you're white, you're at the top of the human ladder of value. And if you're black, you're at the bottom of the ladder of human value. And that is pervasive throughout our society, along with the, uh, uh, the infrastructure that are completely separate, like they uh, separated them officially in 1896 with the Supreme Court ruling that separated two Americas, one white, wealthy, and powerful, one black, poor, and powerless. So we've inherited all of that. The question I have, given that Dr. King focused so much on ending segregation in schools, in housing, and in banking, and we know today that schools are as segregated as they were in the 1960s. We know that housing today, the home ownership among black people is the same as it was in 1950s and 60s at, at 44, 44%. Whereas in white America, it's 76%. And we know that in the last 10 years alone, the banks have been fined more than $243 billion with a B for discriminatory practices that Dr. King was decrying back in the 1960s. So things have not progressed in systemically, even though individually we have overcome some of these infrastructure uh, uh, challenges, even though we have, have to face the systemic dynamic of uh, perception that we are less than, that continues today. The systems are still in place. How do we address the systems? Oh. I think I'd like to step in for a sec, if you don't mind. Um, having grown up here in the Rogue Valley, as a child, I remember this being a sundown town. Um, I remember, I believe we had a black student in my high school tokenism, definitely, the pressure on that poor boy's shoulders for what he represented with all of the messaging that was out there. He was the introduction to my experience, my lived experience with a Black person. In fact, I never had another experience until I was in college. So here in the Rogue Valley, we have had a very slow progress um, to even having a population of people of color to interact with. So segregation is one thing. It's as if our whole valley was segregated, segregated from the nation. And so we're really behind in our um, getting used to having people of color on the streets. I want to I, I, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I want to move uh, to something that uh, Dominique had brought up in our sessions about complacency and how today, instead of being organized and, or, and orchestrating the kind of direct action uh, uh, protest with the specific messaging, uh, we sort of become complacent. Uh, how does that play out today? Dominique, you want to take that? Absolutely. So um, my, well, first, my question is, how has complacency across our institutions enabled racial oppression to flourish? And what I mean by that is when we look to uh, moral guidance, you know, there are plenty of uh, wonderful churches within the, the Rogue Valley, but when it comes to the topic of racial discrimination um, and uh, mob mentality, the mob violence, uh, especially in more recent years, um, what doesn't 
often get brought up is the initial response that Southern clergy had for Dr. King. So this question is directed to uh, Dr. Geneva Craig. Because of your experience uh, down South, I would like your input on the initial response that Dr. King was given from Southern clergy. Well, the Southern clergy were not all together on the same page. Most of the ones in the South wanted you to not, you know, make no ace. Don't bring attention. Uh, things are going along. But there were the clergy who were so astute and saw how we were still segregated, how our needs were not being met, the poverty that we had. And I talk when I say poverty, remember, mine is PO, P O, because we couldn't afford the O R. So mm -hmm. it was PO. And the clergy, the ones who heard Dr. King and who knew that the majority of Blacks were now ready to move forward with a change, we were stuck. We needed a leader and we needed a guidance. And the clergy that stepped forward, the Reverend Reese's, the, the Reverend Anderson's, you know, of, of the churches in my community predominantly and elsewhere too, who opened up the church doors and let Dr. King, his disciples, we call them sometimes, his sergeants, come in and start teaching us and helping us to plan the steps to let our desires, our wants, our needs be known to the rest of the world and the community. Churches back then, yes, there was some division, but more and more came over as they saw the momentum increase. Today, mm -hmm. I don't see where churches played that big of a role uh, like they did back then. Back then, that was our social outlet, our gatherings, our meetings, our sense of uh, being somebody was being associated with the church back then. So Dr. King addressed in his book, those who were thinking we should just sit back and wait that things would evolve, that they would dole us out a little bit more as time went on. No, as he said, we can't wait. Absolutely. And uh, this question is directed to Dr. Dolan. Uh, this is for um, directed towards law enforcement. You spent six weeks in a detention center. And so my question is when it comes to the topic of complacency with racism, do you believe that it's, um, that it's a, a requirement of law enforcement to be complacent with racial bias, as in it is a part of their not overt, but just It is embedded in how they're policing the community and not by police and by com policing the community. I mean, there's that that bias that they're looking for the, the perpetrator and that perpetrator has to have that certain look about them. Do you believe that um, from the 1960s to now is complacency with racial bias? A, a requirement in police trainings? Well, I don't think they're trained to be racist. I don't know. I, I haven't gone through any training myself. Uh, but, you know, the police departments are part of the general society, and we've had these black communities, which have been there for, you know, 100 years or more, 
Um, and so they automatically look at, at uh, the police, which is a white institution, even if there's black police officers, they still represent the white man. And so they're seen as an invading force. And that's gotten worse with uh, war on drugs. And there's another book I recommend, it's by Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow. Hope you've read it. It came out about three or four years ago. And she points out that the attitudes on, on drugs, which were initially supported in the black community, uh, have become so uh, magnified. It's, you know, this SWAT mentality of, of the recent tragedies like uh, Michael Brown and George Floyd. I think Brown and Taylor is the best example. Yeah, she was a uh, uh, living in the black community with her boyfriend. Uh, he had a gun, which was considered uh, appropriate, probably for their situation. And a SWAT team came by and knocked on the wrong door. And I'm sure that's not the first time that's ever happened. And then they banged in, and then uh, gun fire was exchanged, and she was killed. Uh, I think we need to get away from the SWAT mentality and we need to liberalize our attitudes towards drugs i mean if you right now the only way a, a black teenager can make any money is dealing drugs i mean the jobs aren't there anymore and if you saw the movie moonlight which was popular two years ago and won the uh, academy award the three main characters were two drug dealers and a prostitute um and I personally didn't like the movie and didn't think it deserved Academy Award. But the point is, is that uh, a lot of people did identify with that. So I think uh, two things should happen. They, they should modify the attitude towards uh, drugs. And that's beginning to, you know, they're beginning to taper down things like the street, three strikes in your out uh, law and so on. And um, you need to get away from the SWAT mentality. But also the police departments need to reform, not be defunded, but reformed. And they need to start making inroads into the established uh, aspects of the black community, such as the churches, chamber of commerce, things like that. And so the police can be seen as being on their side. Um, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I, I know it's kind of difficult to do, but in advance, I know you've had your problems with the Ashland uh, police force. Sorry about that. Um, but what they need to do is to sort of establish some sort of rapport with the black community. Okay. Let me toss out a question uh, to, to the entire panel. Um, when we talk about reforming these institutions like police, like banks, like uh, the housing industry, urban renewal and zoning and uh, schools and the, and the funding of schools. When we talk about uh, reforming these institutions, we have to have policies and we have to have policy leaders. And Dr. King understood that. In 1960, it was the black population that elevated JFK over Nixon in 1960. But by 1968, Dr. King was gone, Bobby Kennedy was gone, JFK was gone, Malcolm X was gone. The leading voices of the movement for an equitable and inclusive America and the leading voices of the Negro revolution, ending segregation in housing and schools and banking were gone. And Nixon emerged as the landslide victor and white supremacy became the uh, 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 the the the, um, uh, the blanket across America again, and so now we see, and someone mentioned it earlier, that the backlash to uh, the election of a black president was this enormous outcry from white America. In fact, the majority of white Americans uh, voted for. Uh, Trump and white male supremacy, both men and women, and then uh, four years later increased that support. So how are we going to be able to change these institutions and reform them if we cannot overcome the, uh, the, 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 the policies that are, are keeping us from getting to the polls, from putting people in place who can actually uh, begin to change some of the uh, dynamics at the top while we begin to change at the bottom. What's the answer today? Because we're still in the exact same situation. Involved, I would say, would be the uh, biggest um, 
uh, method. I know that Medford School District has just announced the formation of an equity committee to look at curriculum and practices in our district. And we invite people to come on board who have other perspectives. So I would say that that's one opportunity to at least affect a committee in the Rogue Valley having to do with education. Um, My issue, oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Dominique. Oh, um, I was just going to say, um, my issue is that um, from watching the news, watching the um, the behaviors of law enforcement around the country, how they handle situations with uh, violent white supremacists versus um, an unarmed Black man or Black teenager, Black America was made aware more recently than ever that law enforcement is capable of using nonviolent tactics in order to bring perpetrators in. And for me, I want to know how do you how do you instill training to provide that that same courtesy for unarmed black people? Um, I think, you know, one of the things that Dr. King understood so well was kind of this, this balance that you're playing between like policies, like changing policies and changing, changing minds. You know, the fight is, is in the courts and it's in the streets. You know, when the clergy came at him, that's what he said, you know, we're, it's, it's both. So it's not just, um, I think there's sometimes we, you know, there's a, um, you know, there's everyone says, oh, everything, you know, things seem like they're progressing and but the policy doesn't doesn't support that. And sometimes there's a policy that supports an equitable an equitable effort. But if the minds aren't changed, so if you have a, a change in policy within the police department, for example, and, and Vance, you know, is leading the, the discussion out here to change policies within the police department, if you can't also change their minds, you know, and make people believe that this change is necessary. Um, you know, it's moot. I think that's why, you know, really that's why we're doing what we're doing. We're trying to educate, um, educate as, as Dr. Craig has said, educate, 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 um, you know, and, and get people to understand, understand the underlying issues. I need to say something to that. And thank you for pointing that out because I go back to the training that I received as a teenager that I took to my heart, my soul. And it has worked for me. Dr. King taught patience. Patience is of you cannot force people to change, but you can help create the environment that will facilitate change. Individuals make choices. We don't wait. We get those policies and those practices in place. We hold people accountable. And I look at the history of this qualified immunity that came about in the 70s to protect those who do harm to us. And I go, pay attention, people. That is something we need to get rid of. How do we get rid of it? We come together, we all learn about it, and then we demand a change. We help educate our youth in the practices that we need them to trail the path that we need them to go down so that they can understand what is just, what is right, and stand up for it. Our youth are going to make the difference. Old folk dying out. So the old folk need to continue to model just right and having the conviction and the desire and the determination to move forward. Yes, education is the way. Holding people accountable is the way. And getting laws change on the book, because just because it's a law doesn't mean it's just. We want the just laws on the book. Thank you so much. 
Um, I do have a question coming up here, and that question is uh, provided for all of our panelists. Um, do any of you on the panel feel at all optimistic or hopeful for where we are and what we have to do? I think I'd like to step in for a second, speak to some of the white folk that are watching that I may represent on this panel. I think that we have to consider that we have practices and policies that are on one side of the coin, but we have heart on the other. And that changing minds may be, a, um, we all have choices. We all have the decision whether or not to do the inner work to become better human beings. But this is about humanity. And in the long run, Dr. King was talking about being more human, about, um, you know, white folk, we don't have to be heard all the time. We can do some listening and we can read the book and be part of discussions to learn something different maybe something that will speak to our hearts. And I'm so hopeful that as we work as a community, as we, as a panel worked on this book, that we we were able to hear one another and share. And I, I just think that that's an opportunity here in the Rogue Valley. And I am really hopeful that this is an opportunity for us to do that, to change hearts, because the minds follow and the policies follow, but we've definitely got to treat one another a lot better. I just, I just want to add that I am very hopeful for the Rogue Valley. Um, Dayton is a self-segregated city where I'm from. And so I'll just start by saying that um, as much tension as I feel here, um, when interacting with adults, the children are not afraid of me. And I'm so blessed that white children are not afraid of me here. In Ohio, white children are afraid of me, even though they don't know me. And so parents, you are doing something right. Dig and find out what it is that you're doing right and you keep doing it because your babies are not afraid of me and that speaks volumes. Amazing. Yeah, I, I think that um, I mean, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful as well. I mean, I think the pure fact that we were able to do this project here in this valley um, shows that there's some optimism there, right? Um, I think the key again comes down to what all the panelists are alluding to, and that's you know the education coming to what Mike probably knows better than all of us, a common ground understanding, um, because I think we we oftentimes want to advance and tackle issues of racism and different um, uh, things that are unjust without even having a common ground understanding of my difference from your difference. You can't necessarily help me if you don't even understand where I'm at. And I think that's, that's something that we really, we really need to take a look at is the common ground understanding. What is racism? I've heard people say racism and I'm like, what are you talking about? That ain't racism. <laughs> so, you know, there's simple things. There's just simple words we need to understand and have a common ground understanding about um, the history, all of it. I think once we sit down and have these conversations like we're doing today, that's when the work and the journey can begin. I have a question from the audience. Uh, and Vance, you may have inspired it. <laughs> so. Uh, this question is for uh, Dr. D. Dr. Dolan, uh, as a white-bodied male, uh, at the top of the <laughs> racial hierarchical ladder, uh, as a white-bodied male, how do you find yourself communicating to your fellow whites uh, to convince them of people of color's right to equal justice and treatment? And this person is asking because in 60 years, we've now come full circle. And again, white males in particular feel victimized by people of color expressing grief and by their fellow whites supporting a space to see justice. 
we're in the same fight all over again. We could use your guidance. Well, uh, I'm not sure how I can guide things. I do give a talk at, uh, from time to time at Rogue Community College. And the last time I gave at Geneva was there to help me out. Uh, but those are the college students and generally they're very positive. Um, I worked in black sections of town for several decades, 40 years, and I never had any problems there, mainly because we had a specific thing to do and you just do it. Um, I, I don't agree that we've come a full circle. You know, we certainly have had a backlash. We had a backlash with Nixon and a backlash now with Trump. Uh, but uh, hopefully now, uh, you know, history doesn't go in a straight line. It kind of goes up and down, up and down. But hopefully in the long run, things get better. And I am somewhat optimistic that maybe with Biden we'll have uh, an improvement in our economy. Now, the, one of the main problems, it's difficult for a, a white who's out of work, uh, who had a good uh, job in the steel or whatever. And oh, by the way, uh, let me point out, I don't know if you, we moved here because of the Shakespeare Festival. And about four or five years ago, they, um, Lynn Nottage, a black woman, I'm, I'm sure she's very progressive in her politics, I wrote a play called Sweat, and I hope you all see it. I think it was a very uh, astute analysis of the situation. It, it uh, took place, uh, it was based on a real incident in Reading, Pennsylvania, in around the year 2000, when the industries there just simply left town overnight. And so everyone w was out of work. Um, so if you're white, it's, um, you know, you look for scapegoats. And, uh, you know, and you hear all this talk about blacks need to get, you know, um, uh, certain advantages, which I'm in favor of, by the way. And then they feel like they're being uh, uh, downtrodden. And I'm not sure exactly uh, how to handle it. That's a complicated economic problem. I have my own ideas, but they're basically uh, my own politics. Um, let me, let me finish by saying this. Uh, I'm a firm believer in what I call the Rodney King School of Moral Philosophy. I think you guys remember Rodney King in 1992 had the crap kicked out of him by the New Orleans police. It ended up in L.A. burning down, at least a good portion of it. And as Rodney King was healing his bruise and battered body and as L.A. was going up in flames, he was quoted as saying, why can't we all just get along? That sounds simplistic, but I think that you have to sort of approach it that way. Let's just get along. And it's easy for me because when I was in situations in emergency medicine, you don't care whether the lab tech is for a tech or the other doctor you're working with is white or black, whatever. You have to take care of the patient. So if you're doing a job and you're working with someone else, uh, the important thing is whether that person's competent and where you can work together to uh, uh to do the task that, that you're assigned to do. So I am cautiously optimistic, but uh, time will tell. I would have to say that some of those things too have to do with the term white fragility as people come to terms with um, what racism is, the true history, what is colonialism? How did we find found our country on these principles? When all of those things become uh, revealed to a person who may not have had those things taught to them or may not be aware of those things, there's a gut reaction to that, which can sometimes prompt a real fragility around uh, white people accepting that or processing. And I think that, um, you know, we have to give each other grace as we process. And it's not the... Um, it's not the. Um, it's not for black people to do that. We white folk have to come together and talk about it and deal with some of that together as we are in different phases of understanding. So join a book club, find someone you can speak to. Um, I know we're all open to it, and Jackson County Library has some book clubs that, or book studies that they have open. Sign up for them we'll step in and guide them and talk with you. And, um, you know, let's converse, let's talk about this because it doesn't feel good. And people of color have waited a long time. I mean, feel how you impatient you are at the grocery store or at the, 
the uh, the gas line and and that's just for getting a service think about the quality of life and how people have been waiting for their quality of life to improve my god there's got to be some impatience going on so you see some anger yeah it's it's for us. It, it's because people are tired of asking for just a little bit more. Can we just please have some more? Um, you know, how ridiculous is that? Come on, white folk, we wouldn't stand for it. Why should we expect anybody else to? Yeah, we need to speak to the manager. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We do have another question from the audience. Uh, what are some specific goals that have been identified for Southern Oregon vis-a-vis uh, -vis increasing equality in education, housing, and banking? And that is for the panel. I'll, I'll jump in uh, because in one of our book club discussions, uh, we had a, a really interesting discussion about um, one of Dr. King's projects that um, he called Project C, which I don't think made it into the, the highlights of the video, but um, you'll learn about when you read the book. Um, and, you know, the C stood for confrontation and it was just about kind of getting that discomfort going to get to start the discussions to, um, to, to create change. And, um, you know, I think even just just picking, we just kind of picked picked one of those topics in our in our discussion. We picked education, um, which you know, there's a lot of parents on this panel, people who have young children in the valley. Um, so it was something we're all quite invested in. And I think, um, you know, even just thinking about the possibilities of uh, looking at through at it through that lens, our education here in the valley of of where we can make change and where where there's room. And once once you start peeling things back a little bit. Um, there's there's so much to be done and i i think you know i am a broken record but i think um you know here education um specifically is so important and vance's wife tiffany um just helped get past a um uh, a reform in medford school district that we're hoping to replicate um in some of the other towns in rogue valley and vance can speak to more that more to that but i think um that's just one small example of um, something that, you know, is a little Dr. King inspired that um, we talked about and, and people are already turning into action. And then also uh, Ashton City Council just passed a, a resolution to create um, a racial and social equity commission, which is designed in part to review policies and make sure that those policies are adequately reflecting goals of inclusivity and equity. Um, the Oregon Health Authority uh, also pretty recently established a um, social equity, excuse me, an equity-based and inclusion-based subcommittee um, to help address policies that are affecting marginalized communities in the state of Oregon. So there are things going on, and I'm very proud that those things are going on and happy to hear about those things. I just had a comment about the business portion. Um, I do have a hairstylist that I trust. So shout out to Blessings Hair Salon for the culture. Um, when I talked to her about opening up a second business in the Southern Oregon area, she said that it was the climate, that that's why that she didn't want, that she didn't feel comfortable um, opening up a second location. Not that the need isn't there, it's just that it's the climate. It's uncomfortable for people of color. And so um, my personal, you know, follow-up question for the panel is, you know, how do we address that? And I'm also trying to call you out, Mike, because you are the economist. How, how do we rectify this? <laughs> Good call out because I was thinking I have some data on this. <laughs> so um, this notion that um, black people are sitting around waiting for things to change is uh, really uh, ill-conceived and, and, and it's uh, misplaced. Uh, black people have not been sitting around waiting. Uh, we can go all the way back to coming off the plantations. Four million newly freed black people came off the plantations and it was white radicals who changed the systems, not changing the people, but changing the systems so that you had to change the constitution three times 
in order to give these uh, black people uh, the political and economic empowerment that they needed uh, to engage in a hostile white nation. You had to fund a Freedmen's Bureau, a Freedmen's Bank had to be created. You had to impeach a white supremacist president. You had to create a civil rights act of which there have been eight. And the first one was 1866. And so in all this happened in seven years. So we're not talking a whole lot of time here. White people got busy and black people got busy and they black people built 200 towns in 20 years not communities <laughs> towns in 20 years over the course of eight, uh, uh, 100 years from 1865 to 1965 they built 100 HBCUs historically black colleges and universities since Dr King was killed in 1968 the entrepreneurship rate in black america exploded we had uh, less than uh, uh, 300,000 businesses in the 1970s. By the, by the 2012, we had 2.6 2 million businesses. That is hockey stick growth. And even though we didn't have the education that we needed, we didn't have the access to capital that we needed, we didn't have the infrastructure that we needed, we didn't let that stop us. But here's the problem. All that activity didn't turn into productivity. 2.6 million black owned businesses still produce less than 1% GDP. That is 155 years after slavery, less than 1% GDP. Now add in our Hispanic brothers and sisters, less than 4% GDP. And these two populations are gonna represent nearly 42% of the entire population in the next 20 years. And we all produce less than 4% GDP. That's not for lack of trying, it's because of these systemic impediments that remain in place. And so this backlash you see, that's to keep the status quo and the beneficiaries of the status quo in place. We need to disrupt that. And and I'll add just to that, I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of Dr. Claude Anderson, Poweronomics, I don't know if anybody knows that work, but you know, he would talk about after slavery, eight, 1865, you know, just within that 10 year window, you know, we own one tenth of one percent of this nation's wealth. We still own one tenth of one percent of this nation's wealth. There is no progress. OK. And so what we have to do, um, one of the things that I think a lot that is coming out as well, that, you know, we're not pushing it and we're not stomping on the doors and knocking on the doors and trying to do things that we have to be careful of a white narrative. Right. A white narrative that that is something that we really have to be careful of. You know, this term even in itself, when we talk about uh, white supremacy, I, I often hear this term. Um, and, and for me, coming back to just a common ground understanding of that term, how is that even possible? How is there a white person that's supreme over anybody if you're telling me, historically, you have set up, denied me education, put in institutions to not allow me to do things, you've not giving me access and opportunities that you've given your brothers and sisters. If you're so supreme, why do you have to do so much work? So, I mean, we have to take a look at things and just come to a just common ground understanding. And Dr. King actually talks about this in his book, inferiority, inferiority and superiority, that little fakery that's going on right there, cut it out. Next question. So here we are today. And the challenges we have with uh, white society that is not aware of Dr. King's message. Oh, beloved community, uh, peace, uh, nonviolence. These are all wonderful things. But for what end? To what end? Dr. King considered himself a nonviolent warrior fighting against segregation. He had tactics, he had strategies. He wanted to disrupt the status quo in this society and he wanted to teach the children. He said the wisest decision they had was to incorporate the children, thousands of them in Birmingham. And those children left the schools and went out into the streets. They understood the message. They carried on the message. We are not teaching our children. How do we get this book, Dr. King's own words, 
his own understanding into the schools so that when those kids, and I'm talking white kids, when those kids grew up to become police officers, when they grew up to become urban planners, when they grew up to become mayors and, and presidents and, and uh, Congress members, when they grow up, they grow up with the message that Dr. King instilled in them and in us to change this society that we inherited, but we do not need to pass it on. We can change it. How do we get why we can't wait in every school, in every church, everywhere in this Rogue Valley? How do we do that? Starts with what we're doing right now. I mean, it's, 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 it's steps. We know this is a system that wants to backlash anything that comes in that's a little bit darker than them, but we need to take steps. And this is a proper step. It's a conversation and causing and bringing awareness to a topic. And, and what I'm finding many are completely unaware of in the Rogue Valley. And I've seen this firsthand. There's people that tell me they didn't know anything about redlining. And I'm talking about high up officials that didn't know anything about redlining. There's people that tell me they don't know anything about a wealth gap. There's people that tell there's so much here just in awareness that, again, going back, we just got to have those baby conversations so we can take a step forward. Because what we're doing is we're dramatically trying to do something because we're feeling pressure, right? Not understanding exactly where the root is coming from. And I think these conversations will lead to helping explore that, getting into schools, getting into the education system, getting into the business sector, getting into the churches. Mike said it throughout our entire <laughs> book panel. There was an uproar. There was a child here that was shot. Where was our business community? Where was our schools? Where was, why is just random people coming out? Where's everybody in our community that has the zero tolerance for racism? Where are we? And I'll just piggyback on that. Um, you know, reading this book is not just an education for, for white people. You know, this is, we're all subject to the same education systems. This is the, the stuff that's in this book is, is an education for, for everyone. Just, you know, um, you're black or you're, you're, you're in a group that's been oppressed. That doesn't mean you know how you're being oppressed. I mean, Dr. King talks about, you know, the, um, you know, how much you can absorb absorb everything you see around you, that you're less than, that you're, um, you know, that you deserve the situation you're in. Um, so I think this is something that, that I agree with Mike, it needs to be, it needs to be out there, um, but, but for everybody. And you have to remember, go ahead, Dom. go Dominique. Oh, uh, did you have a, a final <laughs> comment before we move on to the next question? Yeah, I just wanted to say, remember this community was a predominantly white community. There was not a need for all of this. Now is the time for change. So we have to remember, we came here, it was white. More color has come. And now we're recognizing we need to educate more. All right, go to the next question. Absolutely. And without further ado, this question is directed for the panel. In the civil rights era, the movement had strong leaders who developed the strategy and designed the tactics, while disciplined followers were trained to implement the tactics, which included much more than protest effectively. Generally, people did not just freewheel their way through the movement. Do you see that kind of organizing coming from Black Lives Matter or other non-centralized groups? Can groups be effective in making progress without strong leadership? And uh, before going fully to the panel, we'll start with you, Dr. Geneva. Oh, okay. Well, I had a leader, Dr. King. We nicknamed the, his followers, his teachers, the people, his disciples, or his sergeant. And that's what teenagers do. Okay, here came Sergeant so and so coming. Here's Bevel. Uh, you know, Hosea Williams, that was my favorite. He was my favorite, I gotta say it. And so, yes, but Dr. King was busy, but besides doing all the writings and the publications that he did, he was busy <laughs> teaching them and training them. And I have to give a shout out to Bernard Lafayette 
Dr. Lafayette was over the voting part for Selma. He was the one who was supposed to get it going. If you notice that all of the sergeants and the apostles, the disciples under Dr. King, how they grew and really got into positions and they earned those labels of doctors and et cetera, congressmen, so forth. Well, because he taught them. Dr. Bernard Lafayette went all the way to the University of Rhode Island and he created that institute on nonviolence and he taught and he, it's still there, Kenyan theories, all of the lessons of Dr. King. This man created a whole course. He's trained people from all over the world in Dr. King's theory, strategies, the plans, and how to be nonviolent. So yes, we got Dr. King's book, but we have other resources that he gave to his disciples to pass out and pass on and to train and educate others. So I am a believer. I am a role model of Dr. King's theory. I am a teacher because of Dr. King. I teach patience, persistence, get a good education. What do you need? Bring in the next person up. Okay, hand back, pull them up, bend that cheerleader, help open the door. The leaders are out there. They're out there. They just need to know that there's going to be some followers. And blacks, people of color, don't just follow anybody. Got to remember that. They don't just follow anybody. They're thinking, is this person going to get us in trouble? Does this person really know what they're talking about? I mean, really. So, yeah, we, we've got the leaders out there. They're out there. What else do you need to know from me? I would also add that Dr. King was a once in a lifetime phenomenal leader who rose to met the need of what his people absolutely needed in the moment that they needed it. And so I would attempt to sort of dissuade anyone who thinks that just because there is not one central figure, one central figure who attempts to speak for all of the inhumane treatment that black and brown people are experiencing in this country as a monolith, to me, that is more of a blessing than it is a challenge. Because that means that the teachings that Dr. King left us with, each one of us as individuals can adopt and decide who aligns with what we see as the issue in our homes, in our communities, in our churches, and affect those things on a micro level while hoping that those who have political power, who have political authority will open their hearts to the needs of those who are suffering in this country and relieve that suffering in whatever way that it is able for them to do so. So I, 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 I love the fact that there is no central voice in the movements that is going on, because to me, it highlights the beauty of how we are able to grow, of how we are able to adapt, and how that there is not a single one of us who's not qualified to affect change. And can and I just throw in one little point there? One little point real quick. The movement without a central leader, who do you assassinate? <laughs> and Black okay. Lives Matter is all over the world. Okay, so on that note, as we wrap up our conversation, uh, what I'd like to do is to go around the panel first, and then we'll we'll, we'll wrap up with uh, Dr. D, and then close out with Dr. G. And what I'd like the panel to do is to just give us one takeaway from why we can't wait. One thing that really resonates with you or one thing you, one thought that you have 
for our, our viewing audience. And then when we get to uh, Dr. D, give us some advice, give us some some uh, guidance. And uh, Dr. G, we know <laughs> we know you can give us some inspiration, something that leads us out of here with uh, some words of wisdom. So let's uh, let's go around the panel and, and get to Dr. D and then end with Dr. G. Should probably address start with me. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Uh, you want me to go first, or yeah, uh, Vance, go ahead. Okay, yeah, well, I said this kind of in the promo, but you know, for me, it was it was just the strategic approach um, to to an actual plan, right? Um, it was really methodical. It was laid out. It was he was well prepared. He he looked at everything that was on the table, everything that was on the table, all options. He researched and understood other people's methods and approaches that worked and didn't work and looked at our situation and how he could strategically work towards the goal. And so for me, I will, like I always say, for me, it's just his, his strategic mind, how he was thinking and preparing for every move, everything. Nonviolence, don't, don't get fooled. That that's that's some kind of weakness. Don't get fooled, cause it ain't. It ain't. And he had a very strategic approach behind all of it. And read this book, because you'll understand that. You'll understand that you read this book. And the last thing I'll say is, like I said before, always a hero in my book. I can't find one person today that is willing to die for all humanity. Thanks, fans. Jessica. Um, I can piggyback on that because. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a new mom. And I think sometimes, you know, especially, you know, after the summer we had, but you know, um, you know, it's been going on since before then it's, it's hard to keep the, it's hard not to feel overwhelmed when we talk about the issues that are in hearts and minds and systems. Um, it feels really overwhelming. It feels heavy sometimes. Um, and I think reading this book, um, Dr. King does such a good job of, and I think it's because of his is his strategic nature and his thoughtfulness, but like he's so strategic, but also patient. And I think um, that was a good lesson for me to just keep the faith that if we keep on this path, um, you know, we're not waiting, we're not resting on our laurels. Um, you know, we're working hard and trying to be patient that this that this change will come. Cause um, yeah, it's a lot sometimes it feels like, it feels like we won't get there sometimes, but um, I think reading this book was a good, sorry, I'm choking up. <laughs> um, it's It was a good uh, lesson to me to keep the faith, so. Thank you, Jessica. Dominique. I would like to um, quote Fred Shuttlesworth. Um, yeah. You have to be prepared to die before you can begin to live. And I say that because uh, as Dr. Geneva Craig said, um, the younger generation, it's not like it used to be back in the day when the, the church was the, the go-to for that soul power. But now what do the, what does the young generation have to look forward to? Well, we have celebrities like Ice Cube. Um, that are talking about reparations and, and plans like that. Like these are what the, the young people are looking at right now. We're not looking at pastors now, we're looking at rappers, I guess. And um, I understand that it can be both a blessing and a curse because um, we have some that may think that civil rights is just for a, a flex or clout or some type of ill-gotten recognition. And that's not what this is about. This is not the time for uh, selfishness or um, some type of ill-gotten merit. This is about basic human rights and how I should have had it yesterday. Thank you, Dominique. Tressa. I would say that the thing that stood out to me the most was that Dr. King in his strategy, strategizing again, realized that not everybody was cut out to march the front line. He recognized that everybody had different strengths and that some people were more resilient and able to actually walk and be 
be brutalized while um, not retaliating. That's a that's an amazing skill, and I'm and I'm not sure that I would have that. Um, but everybody everybody had a place, and there's something to do within the movement. Now, I said this before, but I think that white people in general, especially people here in the Valley, who don't know anything really about Dr. King or about the movement or maybe about black economics or any of the key factors need to do a bit of listening. And I think the start is to read the book, become educated. If you really want to be effective, if you would like to change your heart and maybe your if you'd like to learn to be more human, read the book, start there and participate in some discussions. But we don't have to be heard all the time. Sometimes it's more important to listen. And I have found that to be an incredible gift among all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Tressa. Dr. Saber. It was a wonderful privilege to read Why We Can't Wait. I mean, I took away something from almost every page. I think though the unifying thing for me was love, true love and not love of self, but love of others and not love of others who just look like you, but love of everyone. And such a deep love that he was willing to sacrifice his reputation. He was willing to sacrifice his health, his strength, his life to fight for what he believed in. And so his words are so intentional on painting this inconceivable picture of death and destruction in the black community in 1963. And I can't emphasize enough the love that I read through those pages, the effort and the the, the intentionality that he put in writing every single word so that no one could misunderstand what it was that he was saying and why it was that he was saying it. And so that deliberate love is, is, is what I think that we need to take away from why we can't wait. And I think that we all need to be deliberate in our love to each other and to our beautiful valley. Thank you, thank you, words of wisdom. And uh, there are a couple of people you can't see who are off camera. One is our Facebook monitor, uh, Carrie Turney Ross. And she says, it makes my heart happy to see a community coming together, wanting to do the hard necessary work. Read why we can't wait, but don't stop there. Continue learning, keep reading, keep sharing, start leading. And, um, and she says, let's keep learning these. No, that, I'm sorry, this is Paul. <laughs> Paul is our, uh, he's our engineer behind the scenes. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to see us without Paul. So uh, Paul says, let's keep learning these facts and taking informed action. And so with that, we'll turn to uh, Dr. Dolan. Well, uh... Times have changed in the last 60 years, and it's, I don't think now we can get a leader like Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, mainly because he came out of the Southern religious tradition. It was a Southern Christian leadership conference that he, he led along with Reverends Abernathy and Shuttlesworth. When I was down in New Orleans after the Freedom Ride, a lot of the core activities were done in the church. Um, it's, you know, it, it's a much broader problem now, and I think we'd have to go from um, situation to situation. Right now, the Black Lives Matter movement is dominant, and it's a vibrant force. Uh, I, I, it's hard to see how that can be organized. I think it has to go from community to community. Um, but let me end up by saying this. You know, we moved up to Ashland. Uh, 17 years ago because we wanted to go to the theater and uh, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival is actually world renowned. And uh, Ashland's kind of a white red community. It's a little blue dot in the vast red sea of Southern Oregon. And as pointed out, it used to be a sundown town and something I'm uh, painfully aware of. And sometimes I have a little difficulty even going to Medford, but um, in the thing about the advantage of being an Ashland is if you see a black walking down the street, he's probably either involved with the university, he's a student or maybe a professor, or he's an actor or an actress at the, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So you don't have that, 
that same thing where, where you have a, say, you're walking through the south side of Chicago, it's a very different feeling. Um, personally, I have given a uh, talk for over 10 years now, and mostly at Rogue Community College. I have a friend there, Manny Pacheco, who's a professor of social sciences, and he will invite me to talk to his class. The last time, uh, Geneva came with me, and it went over very well. I've also given the presentation at the Ashland Middle School and at uh, the high school. Actually, I gave it to uh, the Youth Authority in Grants Pass, which is actually kind of a high school there for the poor kids who are locked up. Anyway, uh, so I'm advertising that. Uh, also, we, we give ecumenical devotionals. Uh, it's kind of hard with Zoom, but uh, we used to do it at our home. And uh, I, you know, th there's a strong religious component to this whole thing. I think people should kind of open up their houses. We have people come over and um, uh, participate in, in our uh, spiritual uh, uh, processes. And actually, yesterday when we gave it by Zoom, Geneva participated. It was very nice. And finally, my wife wants me to point out that uh, she's a lifelong swim instructor. She retired from her family swim instruction business. And if anybody wants swim lessons, uh, preferably an integrated group, she'd be glad to, to help out there. So I'm sorry if I didn't really answer your question very well, but there's a few things I did want to put in there. Thank you so much, Dr. D. And Dr. G. Oh, save me for the last, huh? Well, Leave us with some wisdom. Let me tell you this. I love the portion about love. Yes. Dr. King wanted us that love is like the love that God has for his children. And that's the type of love we should have for our fellow men. That is such a strong piece. Service. Yes, we should be of service to make our community the best community that it could be for all of its residents. When you see something, say something. What that means is when you see something that's wrong going on, open your mouth and say, is that, wrong? Is that right? Should that be happening? There are people who are really hesitant because they don't want to be seen as an outlier to the certain group that they belong to. And they'll be really quiet. I love the cell phone. I love these cell phones now because you can record things and say, this was not right. I want us to all remember that the whole reason all of this is going on is because of humanity, that humanness. If everyone, red, black, gray, green, whatever color you may choose you want to be, because people now not only dye their hair, they're changing their skin with this ink. Let me tell you something. We are human. And if each one of us recognize the next individual as human, not just as black or brown. That's the first step. When we recognize that we have one of our brethren or sisters in pain, give them some attention. Just asking, what can I do to help? It can get very overwhelming when you stop and just think about all the different aspects that need to be addressed. And you start going down. Well, I got a solution for that. Everybody put on the OJ. Got to give the people. <laughs> got to give the people. Give the people what they want. Hey, and it's going to outline everything those people want and they need. And your spirit will be lifted. And you'll be ready to go out, be the role model, keep yourself open because white people going to want to talk to you. Don't get that hate and anger. Take a deep breath. 
smile from within and give them the message that they need to receive respectfully. Thank you so much, Dr. G. And Dominique, if you will turn this over to uh, Dr. Sabre. Absolutely, Dr. Sabra. Um, I believe that the people are wanting to know uh, where they can go for more facilitated discussions. Dr. Sabra. Thank you. Um, as we are concluding, I would just like to remind our audience that a few dedicated volunteers from this year's planning committee, including myself, will be hosting facilitated conversations on the book, Why We Can't Wait. There is very limited space available to participate to, and the discussion points, which are originally authored by our facilitators, are both riveting and relevant to historic and current events. Sign up is available on our main website, somlk.org, about two thirds of the way down the page. Meetings will start on Friday, February 5th. Once space fills uh, for the first round of groups, we will collect contact information to gauge community interest in having additional groups starting in the spring. Thank you guys so much for joining us and we hope to see you there. Vance? Thank you so much, Dr. Sabra. Um, as we come to the close here, just I want to just extend a huge thank you to all of you. Um, it was so special. It was so fun. I had such a good time and learning and listening to all of you was just amazing. Dr. John Dolan, Dr. Geneva Craig, I can't thank you enough. Um, thank you to our host, of course, our entire MLK planning committee. There's folks that are behind the scenes, folks that aren't here that were part of so much putting this together. So please know this was a real community effort. Uh, big shout out to my man, Evan Johnson from Blue Shift Media. We had a time putting that video together, man. Um, big shout out. So that I hope you guys continue to watch that. Um, uh, what else? Oh, okay. As a reminder, as a reminder. Just to remind you, um, uh, continue those conversations that Dr. Saber said, okay? Because it's, 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 it's really, really important. Let's have understanding so we can put forth proper action, okay? We don't just need to be doing things. Let's have understanding so we can put, and, and I'm telling you, the facilitators we have are amazing. Just throwing it out there. All right. Um, also, I want to remind everyone um, uh, to go to the somlk.org website. And you can purchase a Why We Can't Wait t-shirt, not only as a reminder of this important message, it's action orientated as it supports a local black business owner, Robert Brown, who lives here in the Rogue Valley. Okay, so go there, get a shirt. Why We Can't Wait, they're really cool. One of them is done by an artist locally here. Uh, other one is just our branding graphic. So it's, it's really special. Um, also to close us off, we will end with an in memoriam created by D.L. Richardson to give our recognition, our appreciation, and our respect to those that have recently passed who are known to have fought for justice and gave us awareness of it. Thank you all, and we hope to continue to see you throughout the year.